Chris. Would you mind sharing with my readers and myself your two childhood contact experiences with an extraterrestrial race? Sure. Um, I grew up in a small community, Burg, New South Wales, with a population of around 4,000 people. Um, and there were, there were more than two golf folks on tour at this stage. But one, the one that I remember very clearly was um, early hours in the morning. I'm assuming around that two or three o'clock in the morning. Um, I remember being leaving my bedroom and going up above the house. I remember vividly looking back at the house from, from an observer point of view. It wasn't a lucid dream or anything like that because I've had those in the past. This was completely different. Um, and I remember ascending upwards quite slowly. Mm -hmm. uh, and I could remember seeing the house and then the picture got bigger. I remember seeing the neighbor's houses. And then I decided to turn around and look up and I remember it was a starry night. Um, I could see all the stars except for this one section above me, which was which was blacked out. Oh, wonderful! So it was actually mm -hmm. there were no no lights mm -hmm. on the craft, but it was I could see it was a metallic structure. There was angles and to the but I would call it circular um, mm -hmm. more than anything. But it was beyond once where I saw that circular figure. There was no stars behind that, so it was just this black. Yes. cylinder right. I've seen that myself in the sky before. Yeah, right above me. And so and if I had to estimate the size, um, it was certainly as big as a house, if not bigger. So we had a three to four bedroom house. Okay, so a, so a normal, a, a normal yeah, yeah. Australian house. So. Yeah, normal Australian house. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I would say it would have been as wide as a house, possibly as wide as the yard, mm -hmm. so to speak. We had a small walkway up either side of the house, mm -hmm. probably a few metres. Okay. Um, so I remember looking looking up at that. I don't have a lot of memory of being in the bed and leaving the bed, but I do remember either coming through the ceiling or the wall, mm -hmm. or, or I'm pretty sure it was the ceiling, and ascending upwards towards the craft, which I'd say was probably a few hundred metres when above you, the house. When you got into the craft, what, did you see yourself as a physical being, or were you more of an astral? No, well, as I ascended up to the craft, a lot of my memories faded as I was going through mm -hmm. by approaching the bottom of the craft. Um, so that's that was a very, I assessed my age to be somewhere around about eight or nine years of age. Ah, oh, okay. So again, mm -hmm. and this, while I have a, a memory of it now, growing up as a child, it wasn't that big of a deal to me. Um, mm -hmm. I still lived a very normal life. I had um, good friends. It was like adding value yeah, to your childhood. Yeah, it was just one of those, you know, <laughs> unique experiences that I, yeah, I you thought, could share you know, my morality like was still being moulded as a child. Mm -hmm. I didn't know it was out of the ordinary. I didn't know it was unique mm -hmm. because I had nothing to really, I had no lifetime to compare it to. No, of course not. So for me, um, it was just a cool thing that happened. Yes. I didn't feel any fear um, or anxiety, stress, none of that. It was quite a peaceful experience and a, and a pleasant one. Mm. Uh, but again, as I moved up to that craft, to the bottom of it. I just remember seeing totally blacked out and as I got closer then I was able to see the the, the structure mm. of, of the craft and also the shadows. There was enough light, street light to be able to, you know, lights in town just to sort of pick up some of that casting of the, of the bottom of the craft. But, but I don't recall any lights around the base of it. So you remember bottom. you remember the ascension into the craft? Yeah. And as a child was that purely the only memories you, you had of ascending or were you actually on the craft? Did you engage? Did you... Um... No, I, have, I don't have much memories. Yeah, most children find it's just yeah. the ascension or, or... Yeah, it was just yeah. basically mm. leaving the bedroom to the craft mm. uh, and then from that point forward and I, you have I don't have... two distinct memories of doing that? Uh, that was mm -hmm. that was one... That was one at eight or nine? Yeah, one at eight or nine. Mm -hmm. The next one was around the age of, I would assume, to be nine to 10. And okay. I remember this one, this is probably the most definitive one that I remember more than anything because it was Christmas Eve. Oh, okay, uh, so you're waiting for Santa. Yeah. Was, excited. Yeah. So I remember going to bed. I had um, good parents, normal. It was myself, my sister, and my, my mother and father all living in the house together. It was a normal household. My, my father, my mother was a secretary. My father worked for had his own business driving trucks. Mm -hmm. And there was no violence, there was no drugs or alcohol abuse in the home. I was I had a good upbringing. Mm -hmm. um, I was loved by my parents. Nothing out of the ordinary. So um, I remember waking up in the early hours of the morning again. Uh, I was, it, it, this, this 
time frame of two to three in the morning seems to be just yes, the, popping up around about they, that time. They call it the UFO time, the twilight yeah, zone. Yeah, I think it's <laughs> in, the, in that deep sleep. Mm. But I remember I was lying on my side and, and my bed was up against the wall, so I was lying on my left hand side, which put my back to the wall, mm -hmm. and then there was just a another spare bed on the other side which, which no one slept in, I was only about friends over. And there was a small little gap between the beds which led to the doorway, mm -hmm. which then led into the hallway which led into the kitchen. If I remember lying on my side, I remember looking into the doorway and I saw this figure in the doorway. It wasn't moving, it was just it was just standing there. Mm -hmm. So I actually sat up in, in bed and stared at the figure and we had this telepathic con conversation mm -hmm. where it said everything's okay just go back to sleep and against what all my wishes to actually get out of bed and sleep go and hug I, yeah, I, I <laughs> finally saw Santa Claus mm -hmm. um, I saw the, saw the shape mm -hmm. the figure of Santa Claus in the, in the doorway and again I just weirdly went back to sleep even though I didn't really want to you and I have actually shared got a shared experience I've had something very similar when I was a child too yeah mm. yeah and I remember being so excited initially excited to see Santa Claus, but then it kind of um, quickly disappeared to, it's okay, go back to sleep. But I remember waking up, I remember having a good, I don't recall waking after that period until I woke early in the hours of the morning. Mm -hmm. I remember running out into the lounge room announcing to my family that I actually had seen Santa Claus yes. in the doorway and I was very excited to tell them. Yeah. And they just dismissed it and thought, well, you know, it's a kid's imagination. You know, wow. he's very excited about Sienna, um, and and we left. That's pretty much where it finished for me. But I, but one other thing, going back to the first experience, one thing is I just remembered actually as well mm -hmm. is that's that's floating sensation when I was ascending into the craft. It was such a euphoric feeling. Mm -hmm. I remember getting up the next morning and going in the backyard, and I actually looked up above the house to where I craft was the night before and just trying to have a look around and see if there was anything there that I could trigger my memories. But I remember jumping up and down on the grass trying to duplicate that, that, that float, feeling, that ascendant feeling, hoping that I was going to float off into the to sky because it felt so so euphoric and so real. It does, yeah. I know exactly what you're... I, I can't believe that you and I have had a very similar Santa experience. Yeah. So yeah. we'll talk about that yeah, post sure. the interview. Yeah, and, and this will, mm -hmm. again, um, mm -hmm. There was no fear, anxiety. There was no stress involved. It was I was a kid, experiencing life. Um, my part reality of, was still part being of your formed. normal upbringing. Yeah, mm. like I said, and there was there was really nothing. The next day I woke up, I didn't show any signs of distress. Um, and for me, it was just, it was Christmas Day. It was a time to be enjoyed. Now you mentioned before to me that there was a remote military element to these childhood experiences. That more, they were more later on in life. Yeah. Oh, that was yeah, more yeah, your yeah, adult side. Yeah, the adult side. Okay. I think um, mm -hmm. when it became more apparent mm -hmm. that they were also monitoring things as well. Oh, okay. So, mm -hmm. but through my childhood years, um, everything was fairly, fairly smooth. Um, and I did have another experience. So I'll, I'll lead up to the one that was 20. The one that 20 was what changed everything for me. Would you like to share your teenage contact experience at North Burke now, Chris? Yep. Um, North Burke is probably situated, I'd say, probably five kilometres from Burke itself. It's you, you, you leave Burke and you head out and you cross over the, the North Burke Bridge, um, and then as soon as you get across the bridge, there's a small community and also a pub that's situated. So, growing up as a child, you know, in a small community, we often made our own fun between swimming in the river and motorbikes and camping. So it was decided that uh, myself and two of my friends would camp in the galleys, literally half a kilometre from the North Burke settlement. And mm -hmm. it, was, it was right beside the river. So anyway, so we got our, my father dropped me out um, and we had all the camping gear and we, and we set up a fire. And it was later in the afternoon, we decided that we might go and see if we could purchase some alcohol. Can I ask a quick question yeah. for people watching this from overseas? Can you explain where Burke is in Australia? Burke would be uh, western New South Wales. Mm -hmm. So it's quite a remote community. Perfect. It would be essentially around 4,000 people. And I'd say the nearest city to that would probably be 
Dubbo, which is probably 350, 400 kilometres away, was probably at the time had a population of 30, 35,000. So long, it's very, it's very, <laughs> great distance. It's very isolated community. Yeah. And there are a lot of smaller communities around there, like the um, a few, but again, they're about the size of Burke, and if not smaller. Mm. So Burke was very unique. It had a lot of very strong personalities within the community, and a lot of characters. And it was a bit of a, it had social problems within the, in the community, but it was a very. I loved going up there. I had good, good friends. And you would have known everybody, literally. Yeah, every, everyone knew so, everyone, and my, and my um, family had a strong connection to the area as well. My my father was raised in that region and my grandparents also lived in that region and owned a lot of property. I think I interrupted yeah. you when you were just about to commit fraud by going and buying yeah, alcohol. Yeah, that's right. Okay. That's right. <laughs> I actually remember, still remember the guy's name actually. But it, um, yeah, so and I was probably the gamer of, of the three and it was just like we put our money together and we didn't, we, we didn't have a lot back then but you didn't need a lot. So we decided that um, we are going to buy a bottle of Stone's Green Ginger Wine. Oh, yeah, the hard so, stuff. Yeah, yeah. I think it was about four dollars or three dollars or something. It wasn't. It wasn't a lot much. of money in those days for yeah, teenagers. Yeah. <laughs> so we headed over to the pub, and uh, I'd gone around to the back of the pub and, and where the takeaways were, and I basically sat and waited. And the guy come out and looked at me and said, "Can I help you?" And I'm thinking I was going to probably get a packet of chips or a bottle of coke, but I said, "No, I like to buy a bottle of stone drink and wine." He said, "He said, how old are you?" I said, "Oh." I'm sure it was 14, I think that was my answer at the time. So, and he shook his head and he said, he said, who's your father? And I said, and I, said I told him who my father was. He goes, yeah, I know your father. I said, but he's not coming out to pick us up tomorrow. I said, we camped just over from the, from the pub over in the gully. He said, well, that's swags. And he paused and thought about it. He said, okay. So I'll, I'll serve the bottle of green mm -hmm. stones, green gin wine. So with that, we purchased it. And, and also I got a bottle of lemonade. I remember to go with it. <laughs> so we took it back over and we didn't initially drink it straight away. We actually sat with it for an hour or two and then we decided that we'd, that we'd mix it. So I'm assuming while this, while this all took place, I'm assuming the time frame was probably around 10 o'clock. Mm -hmm. 10 o'clock to 11 o'clock at, at night before we decided. And I remember pouring it aside. So we'd consumed some of the lemonade or we'd tipped some lemonade out and we'd poured stones, green ginger wine into this big bottle of lemonade and we mixed it, we changed it. And I remember just finishing it and, and sitting in the chair and it was, it was quite dark and I had my two friends with me and I remember the bottle being full and then in the flash the bottle was empty. You hadn't actually drunk anything. And I hadn't even put it to my lips. So, <laughs> and then I remember cursing my friends for, for taking it off me. Yeah, they were no debris to be found. So, so they they had disappeared basically. They, my friends had disappeared. Your alcohol had disappeared. Yeah, I had a, I had a missing time event um, oh. from having a full bottle of um, bottle of Stone's Green Ginger Wine in my hand mixed into a mixed with a bottle of lemonade, which basically went from full to empty mm -hmm. in the blink of an eye, and I hadn't drank it. And what, then I did I, you check your watch? What time it was? No, I, then I started. Um, accusing my friends of taking it, mm -hmm. yet they were, they were nowhere to be seen, and then that is the last thing that I remember all that night. And then just waking up the next day. Waking then. up the next morning and saying to my friends, "What happened to you last night?" They said, "Nothing. We were here." And I said, "No, I was looking for you. You weren't here." They said, "No, so we couldn't find you." Ah, so, okay. Yeah. So maybe when they were out looking for you, you then yeah, and it's just, and then but I, I just remember it's it's the same common theme of that that um, that feeling of something's missing. I've, yes. I've missed a lot of time here, or some a lot has passed, mm. and it's gone from here to here with no recollection of the events in between. Did your friends give you any indication of how long they searched for no, you? No, no, mm. and I'm still to this day because I've relocated from Burke. Mm. The interesting thing is that one of my friends. The same one of the friends that was with me on, on the um, campsite has come up and said to me at school one day, he said, do you know that they developed anti-gravity devices for the UFOs? And, um, and we've had the discussion at school about some of the technologies that we were interested in. And this, this particular friend was present at that night. So it's one of those situations I'd like to engage in now to mm -hmm. see, because we've, really, we've lost contact for 15 years, I would like to see how his life has progressed 
just if, if when it's we, only been similar to mine. When we put this on YouTube, you can send him a link to it. Yeah. So he can. So it's not as confrontational. Yeah, and I just have an underlying feeling that he experienced the same thing I did that night. Chris, I believe you had an intense contact experience as an adult at 21. What made this experience different from those of your childhood? Well, this was very, it was a very intense experience because this is the one that opened the floodgates to speak. So this was the one that made, I became aware of what had been happening my entire life through my childhood and the ramifications of what it meant uh, for myself, what it meant for this planet, what it meant for the rest of humanity. Um, so this is this is the one. Wow, that sounds really big. Yeah. So <laughs> it, it it was it was it was mind blowing and mind shattering, and I can't put enough emphasis on how intense that that feeling uh, was. Twenty one though, that's still still very young to be having this given to yeah, you. Yeah. Look, it, I, it's such an overload of information. Nearly broke me. Mm. Nearly psychologically broke me. So it was, um, as they say, it was a uh, transference of knowledge. Yeah. Or yeah. Do, do you remember that? Well, it, I do because I'll, I'll probably focus on the experience the night and I'll go on to the changes the following days and weeks. Oh, please do. Mm -hmm. So the, um, again, um, we'd relocated from Burke. My parents had, had moved from Burke to Naramite. Um, and my father was working with the RTA and my mother, again, was a secretarial duties. And I'd, I'd initially stayed out Work for another 12 months working on a property, but I decided to come back, move to Narrowmine, and live with my parents. Um, so I, I, I'd met a girlfriend at, at the time, and she would moved in, and we the we'd converted the TV room into a bedroom, which is off off the side of the house, which is off also off the kitchen. Mm -hmm. So um, my, my girlfriend had moved in, um, and I was she was 19, and I was approximately 20 or just turned 21. I think I was just turned 21. Mm -hmm. And she had to go away for some training with the job to Melbourne, so she was gone for a week. Mm -hmm. So the experience happened within that week that she wasn't there, and I have oh. no doubt <laughs> that timing. it was timed. Yeah. Or, be, or great timing. Yeah, to be that way. Um, anyway, again, um, early hours of the morning, I'm shooting around 2 to 3 o'clock in the morning as well, just in that common theme um, of when I was in deep sleep. Mm -hmm. This one was very, very different because I felt I had a foreknowledge of what, what was about to take place or what was coming. Oh, okay. That, that is that, different. Yeah. That makes sense because I remember putting up a struggle on this particular time and I hadn't done... So you, you felt some kind of fear? Yeah, this, this, this okay. one I did. Like an this, inbuilt fear of what was coming? Well, I, probably a fear of being not in control of myself. Oh, okay. I think it would, so, would be the so you're more speaking. angry then, in a way. So well, you're being manipulated. Yeah, I'll be manipulated, and I and I had no control over that. So the, that was probably the fear based on not being able to control my own body or con control. And I guess it was a safety factor built into that. Yes. That I was at someone else's, you know, control. Mercy. Yeah, mercy, and really, <laughs> and there's nothing I could do about it. Mm. So I remember like, I've been on my back, uh, and I remember my left hand arm um, being raised and put back down again. But the weird thing about this, no one touched my arm. And I, and I remember the first thing I thought was my arm moved, but I did not tell it to move. Mm. As if my, I, was, I had been hijacked. Yes. So my mind had been hijacked. And the test was to see if they actually had control of me by telling my arm to move remotely. Mm. And the very first thought I had was, I didn't tell my arm to move. And I, ha I had no feeling of um, the arm being touched or lifted. Mm. So it was at that point, the um, struggle began, even though that I don't think I even really moved. But I just remember trying to fight the control over me, mm -hmm. and it was so overpowering, and overwhelming, so, so overwhelming, so intense. Mm -hmm. um, it'd be like I, you know, I was, I was fully charged battery, and I was drained nearly flat in a matter of seconds. And and I'm a pretty strong character, and pretty strong constitution. Like I grew up in Burke, it was a rough, tough mm -hmm. community to grow up in. And I could handle myself okay, but oh, I had no chance of, yes. of overcoming that. I just knew that. So, and I remember them being around the bed, 
I was standing around the bed. It was a, actually a water bed. Mm -hmm. do, I do remember a little bit of movement taking place in the water bed. Um, so with that, I remember basically being taken and taken up through the corner of the room again. Mm -hmm. up through, I went straight through the wall. I, um, I didn't feel the wall. Mm -hmm. I didn't feel anything um, physically. But I just know I passed straight through that solid, solid object between the wall and the, and the corner of the roof. And again, there was the craft up above my parents' house. Mm -hmm. And then the same, same ex experience um, going up through into the craft as it was when I was much younger. But the, but the feeling around this one was very much different. Mm -hmm. I think, and I think I'll put it down to I'd actually matured as a person. You know, you're going from an eight to ten year old up to a, a person of 20. So, you know, I'd gone from a child into manhood. Mm -hmm. So I, I felt that, you know, I had the ability to protect myself because I was a, a mature person. Yes. And that was what was taken from me. That was probably the fear factor around, around that. Um, and, re and that, again, into the craft, I remember them being around my bed at the time, but I don't have much recollection of that point forward, mm -hmm. after that point. Mm -hmm. And I remember waking up the next morning as if someone would flick the switch, and my eyes were wide awake. So I'm just turning me on. And like I'd been told to wake up this particular time. And I flew out of bed. And I remember going and talking to my parents, asking them if there was anyone in the room. I knew the answer, I knew that wasn't them, but I just had to tick that box just yes. to say, eliminate that, just the off chance that they were in there for some reason. Mm -hmm. And they said that they weren't. They had no reason to be in there the hours in the morning. Um, but, and then as the minutes, hours went by, the, the memories, started to flood back. Yeah. I did have a sense of, of violation, of sexual violation. Oh, okay. uh, I remember waking up up with that. Mm -hmm. I thought I was being invaded, I thought it was intrusive. Um, mm. And... So the the childhood experiences well, were well and truly over and you'd moved into... I'd moved into the yeah. next phase. Yeah. yeah, the next phase. And I felt like all the childhood experiences were schooling. Yes, preparing so speak, you, maybe preparing me for something, grooming you for what was grooming me for later on. I think, and I said, mm -hmm. a lot of the information that had been probably dormant inside me for all those years was switched on, but at the same time, I was switched on to wake up. Right. So there was an overload of information taking place, mm -hmm. and it was like a hard drive that had been maxed out. Did you have a headache or a migraine? Or I had, a, yeah, I, I really was in a state of. I wasn't in a state shock when I woke. Altered state? Yeah, I was in an altered state, but as, but then I remember sitting um, in the land room an hour or two later, and then all the memories of my childhood hit me like a wall. Whoa, so everything, were, everything, all the visits. Me. Yeah, all oh. the visits would come back, and I was, I think I was made aware that they were, what they were really were, mm -hmm. um, especially the Santa Claus one in Dorlay. That was one that hit me first. So you had a lot of confirmation in a very yeah, short yeah, period of time. Yeah, I had, Wow. Um, images and flashes hit me from all directions all the same time and, and on top of that was all the information that had been given about what's happening on planet Earth. So I had that crammed in in an instant. Is uh, there something you'd like to share with us now about planet Earth? Oh well I think um, humanity is starting to see the effects of, of just how long we've got it. Uh, yeah. And it, I see that escalating. It's going to get worse before we get better. I don't mean to say that in a negative way. I think it will be the death of the old and the birth of the new. Mm. Sometimes those things that will be chaotic in the transition. I think um, you know, the respect of politics globally, governments are failing globally. Um, they're not failing in the sense that it, they're supposed to fail, they're designed to fail. Mm. That's part of the program. Um, and I think people are, are wake up to that, they look at the monetary system, the health system's failing, education, education system. system's failing. Um, yes. And I think people's general well-being and mental health is also failing. Definitely. I think we're reaching a new paradigm mm. where um, things have been turned on. DNA has been activated from solar flares. We're in a different location within the universe now. Mm. All that is playing a part in all where we're at. And I think um, we're at a critical point in our evolution. I think the time has come. Receive support from your family in regard to your ET related revelations, or has it been a difficult path to walk? It's been very difficult. Um, if, to speak honestly, it would just mean uh, 
probably the biggest challenge of the experience has been um, integration into society and family has been a part of that. It's been, um, it took me quite some time to tell, to tell my family what had happened. It, it was a couple of years after the, the experience of 21 before I eventually told my family. 23? Yeah, 23, 24. 24. I was living in another, I was relocated to another place called Parks and I was, I was actually living there at the time. Um, so, I've just got to interrupt you here. Yep. You're, you've named Back of Burt, Parks, Narrow Mine, and all these are all hot spots. Oh, okay. Yes, so yeah. you, you're basically just doing a whole UFO trail here. Yeah. The kicker. Yeah, well, they, 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 they followed me everywhere I've gone. Yes. Um, you've gone so to all I, the right places. Yeah. <laughs> so I actually lived in Parks for four years. I was actually a spray painter at the time. Um, so I'd gone back, and life was not life was challenging for me. At the, through that period, I was literally waiting for the sun to go up. So I'd go to bed, wait till five, half past five, the sun would come up, or just break the horizon, and I'd, that, my sleep pattern was from five to seven, half past seven. Really, just two and a half hours a yeah. day, basically? Yeah. Wow. Is and that because you were frightened to sleep? Yeah, I just was too scared to sleep. Yeah. Is, is this when you got the night light? Yeah. Or, yeah. Yes, I think most. We've already talked about yeah. my nightlight usage, but most UFOlogy yeah. people or people that have been abducted um, yeah. cannot sleep in complete darkness. Yeah, and it was initially after the, the awakening of the 21. From that period, I'd say it lasted probably 6 to 12 months until eventually I wasn't functioning. You grew a pair basically, unlike yeah, me who yeah. still sleeps with their nightlight. I had to, just had to <laughs> deal with it, um, and I was, I was really working during the week and, and sleeping on weekends to prepare me for the following week. Mm. So it was, Soaring up. Yeah, so it really, really hit me like a, hit me like a brick wall. Um, well, you, how long did you go on like that, the, the only two and a half hours sleep? Uh, I just wasn't functioning. No, I was going to say, uh, not anyone. <laughs> okay, occasionally I just got to the point where I was so tired that I would fall asleep maybe early hours of the morning, but, mm -hmm. you know, I'd wake up and check and then I'd go back to sleep again. So it was always always unbroken sleep. Mm -hmm. oh, so I mean broken sleep mm -hmm. and not, not quality sleep. So, you know, the, the, the hours that I was getting, you know, were very, it wasn't quality sleep, it wasn't deep sleep. I was always on the alert and my senses were very heightened. Mm -hmm. um, I, I was picking up on people's senses and feelings uh, uh, yeah. and things like that. So every, I was hit, not just with the information I was giving, but just all, all the extra stuff that went with, with the awakening as well. And how it affected your family and immediate friends, I imagine? Yeah, yeah. Did you lose some friends? Um, I suffered a bit of post-traumatic stress disorder, so my friends were wary not to set me off. Oh, okay. Uh, well, they were still around though. That's yeah, they, they stuck by me. I had a different network of friends because I left Burke and moved to Narramine mm -hmm. originally. Um, so I got a bit of a reputation that I was short tempered. You know, I could really lose it pretty quick. You know, I really became um, the person that you probably didn't want to confront when I was in that in that part of my life. Mm -hmm. And and that was one of the reasons that I, I simply just had to get on top of this and, and make sense of what was going on. Yeah. So it, although, you know, it was a, a tough experience, I don't want to put this in a negative light mm -hmm. um, because it moved on past that to what I am today. So where do things stand with your family at this point? Um, it's fine, as long as I, never, I don't bring it up. <laughs> okay, so it's the secret, yeah, it's, like we're, it's we're, a family secret. We're essentially, you know, 23 years later and You've never sat down and talked. No, we sat down. We sat down, and the, the weird thing about this is, growing up in, as a child and work, my father told me a story of his experience. Oh, okay. Uh, and now so. he was working on. Uh, he travelled Australia in the late '60s uh, with a friend from Burke, and I was working on a communications tower in Geraldton in Western Australia. He said the Americans were building it at the time, and he said on a Friday night they put an outdoor picture theatre on for all the workers, and so the, he said there was probably 250 to 300 people working on this communications tower at any given point in time. And he said it was a Friday night and the movie was playing and so the craft stopped above them for a period of 10 to 15 seconds and then shot up at a phenomenal speed across the horizon. Wow, okay. So, you know, this is a story that I knew growing up as well. Um, so I think the story that I went to approach my father was, was, was much more deep than that. It's the fact that I was having contact with these extraterrestrial races from, from a child and I just don't think he really coped with the magnitude of what I was telling him. 
Oh, perhaps there was a little bit of guilt and I there think, too. And I think the, the reason it hit him so hard because I think deep down he knew what I was telling him was, was correct and true yeah. because he had seen that for himself. And I think it just really struck him to the core. Uh, so to this day, I don't approach my father about it. We've had we have had discussions um, around the round table discussions in the past, and I brought up the time. So Dad, remember the time you told me about it, what you saw, mm -hmm. and it's like it didn't happen now. Oh, um, okay, it's so complete it's denial then. <laughs> yeah, denial. Brush on the carpet. I don't want to talk about it. Are you, um, are you so, happy? Are you okay with that? Or uh, look, I'd like to fix it, but my sister and I spoke about it. And okay, she's open to it. Obviously, my sister is totally on board. Lovely. Yeah, I have full support of my sister. Um, we're very close. And of course, your wife. Yep. Yes, I think you've got your support structure now. Yep that you, you probably needed back then when you were in your early 20s but you've, you've got that structure now yeah and, so. I've, and I've had it for a good with my wife and my sister I've had that for a good 15 years wonderful so that without that um, I don't know you know just how much stuff it would have been but it would have been a lot tougher oh definitely so, I, yeah. but every now and then I'll, I'll sit and talk to my mum uh, I did to actually tell her that I was doing this presentation so there's a degree of anxiety about it and I said look no worries it's not gonna be Sunday Telegraph it's no. not gonna be so it's all cool so I'm conscious of how this may or well, may not affect them as well I mean especially if it gets out to the point where they're recognized but, mm -hmm. but that's just the world we live in you know but I've pushed all that to the side most people will um, will be within our community viewing it yeah. I can guarantee it. Yeah. It's very rare that anyone um, external to our community will even go searching for yeah. this, this kind of fodder. So, um. Yeah. So initially when I broke the story to my parents, it was around the age of 23, 24, it, it didn't go well. Um, while I know my mother believes me, um, she prefers not to talk about it. And yes. she'll, she'll usually find another topic very quickly. Too quickly to, <laughs> to change the topic quite quickly. Yeah. And I'll also say, Mum, I, I know what you're doing. It's okay, but I know I know exactly what you're doing at the moment. Do you think it's that generation as well, yeah, though? Yeah, I, mean, I, I do believe. I do believe it's, it's a generation thing. I don't do believe that they never had access to the amount of information that we have today. Mm -hmm. And I do believe that they're probably a victim of their own circumstances. And they were also taught, you know, you don't make an issue. You don't make yeah, a fuss. Yeah, and it's, um, it's mm -hmm. something that, I mean, I, if, uh, my wife and I did lose our first child together, so we she's gone on to get into counselling and grief from that and I've also done some counselling myself and the old mentality was to lift brush on the carpet and not to talk about it. Exactly. Now I realise how wrong that is. Yes. And I think that's just across the board, not just in in grief but in all forms of experiences is that, you know, bring it to the surface, talk to the people who know who have probably experienced it. That they had they're the ones that have the greatest knowledge. Well, I know, I know with stillborns now, they let the mother hold the baby for a couple of hours next to her body. Yeah. And yeah. To, to help that grieving process. Absolutely. And it works. Absolutely. Yeah, it does. Yeah. It does. So, so I think, you know, when I sort of initially told my father, he didn't take very well. We didn't talk for probably six months. Um, really? Okay. Yeah, yeah, it was that long. That was a lot of denial yeah, no, built up. Yeah, and I yeah. think, um, and I know he had a, a hard time sleeping as well. Mm -hmm. with it and, and I think but as the years have gone by I've slowly worked at them and and my mother does know the story uh, of, of what's happened probably not to the full extent of obviously what I know she can handle I'll but, share with her but have you ever thought that perhaps your dad's feeling guilt because it is a generational yeah. thing so yeah. I mean I've I've had my own 13 year old daughter about five years ago when she was 13 approached me about something and yeah. I felt the pattern had repeated in my family and for, for a few days like I didn't know quite how to handle the situation and in the end I sat down and I just told her everything and said this is what I think is happening and this is you know yeah. and um, so she now she talks to every everything she feels something in the room she starts having a chat to her yeah. you know yeah. and um, but we that's because I didn't want her to have the experiences that that I had, which were initially quite, you know, polarizing. Yeah. So, but it is a generational, you know, yeah, every generation yeah. seems to. to hit it, it is. We seem we just seem to advance more in our understanding of it. I think that seems to make the path somewhat easier. 
you'll probably be having a discussion with your own children yeah, coming up. We have. You have already done that? Yeah, as I said, yeah. So, and I, so much so that I'll pre warn my wife before we had children that was going to take place. Yeah. So, in house. Um, most of the experiences I've had have been positive. But there was really only. It, I still have the, um, the night light thing, yeah. but apart from that, the, one, the experiences I remember are very, they're very benevolent, they're very lovely to me. Mm. So I just, I can't really connect the negative scenario. But I haven't, I don't think I was ever part of the hybrid breeding program though. And that has a different level, it takes it up an extra level of fear in my mind. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Would you mind telling us about your 2013-2014 Dubbo contact experience which involved other family members? Yep, sure. Um, I'd, my parents were still living in Aramon but I had um, met my wife and we'd uh, moved to Dubbo. And we'd, I guess we'd been living there uh, for probably in the same house for probably five to six years. Um, again, Normal house, normal family. Well, you know, I've really shied away from alcohol and substances. I was never drawn to any of that stuff. Uh, and again, it's a particular night, um, early hours of the morning, I woke up and it was an identical feeling that I had as a child where I sat up in bed um, and there was another telepathic communication was, don't worry, everything's going to be all right. But it was the integrity of the message that I'll never forget. It was the it was like it was no, none of my five senses would have been used with this message. It was it had a tone to it, a substance to it, that I knew I was in the presence of something highly intelligent. Wow. Just from the quality of that telepathic message. It was very, yeah, it was just very unique. Uh, it wasn't coming from a, from a human, human mind. Were you talking or were you thinking? No, because again, against all my desires to get out of bed and investigate, mm -hmm. um, I went back to sleep. Oh, okay. And I'd been preparing for this event <laughs> all my life. So the next time I came around, I was so determined mm -hmm. to confront this mm -hmm. um, and have that face-to-face -face communication that I've been so longing for, because um, I have so many questions. Mm. It, and yet, instantly again, I was overpowered and I, no fear. Um, no anxiety with this one again um, and my wife was beside me in bed she, she was asleep she didn't wait and with that I'd gone back to sleep um, I woke the next morning again pretty normal good sleep wake up it wasn't like the 21 experience where I was switched or sleeped on it was yeah. just a just a normal waking mm -hmm. um, and then I'd gone into the kitchen and my boys had uh, two boys mm -hmm. um, they will put them around the age of uh, eight and six. Okay, so getting to the ages of your first yep, experience. Yep, at the mm -hmm. time, and they had come out into the kitchen and described the experience that they had the night before. Oh, okay. Which included, <laughs> which included going through the ceiling and ascending uh, as you had previously. Yeah, up through the ceiling, mm -hmm. and also it was very, very descriptive of what was in in the ceiling because I was the only one who had been up in that ceiling because mm -hmm. I had to go and fix the TV aerial and so I'd gone up into the manhole in the garage and made my way up and it, there was aluminium foil up underneath the tiles mm -hmm. as well as netting, um, some boards and my eldest son described exactly what he saw. He said there was all this silvery shiny stuff up in the ceiling that I said and then we went